Am I giving the interview or are you giving the interview? I do not make acapellas. A soft take on me. <laughs> Yo, kid, I think I'm high, man. I think I'm high, man. New York, New York. What's the deal, son? Creamers, welcome to Get Creamy. Cream on Top segment where we go into the minds of cool performers, people who do cool things, and try to figure out how they do them, or where they came from, or where they're going next. Today, we have on the show, Mr. Mel Star, no headphones in Harlem, hip hop, scratch enthusiast, DJ extraordinaire. He's also producing music, He's doing things, he's in Vegas, he's in New York, he's all over. We first met on the set of Master of the Mix, which was sponsored by Smirnoff, and the two of us hit it off like rocks and vodka. It is my pleasure today to interview DJ Melstar. So without further ado, let's get creamy. Guys, we are here in the Austin airport, as you can see. Not too many people, but we are on our way to Charlotte to film Mr. DJ Melstar. We are going to have one hell of a fun time in Charlotte with Melstar. And you guys are going to come for the ride. Now let's go. All right, so the flight got delayed an hour. It's all good though. We got the laptop, we're working. We're gonna get there. Here we go, kids. So here we are in another pretty darn empty airport, Charlotte. It's gonna be pretty interesting. Hopefully our bags are still there so that we can get this shoot on. All right, we're here in Charlotte. With Melstar, we're doing some location scouting. Yep. We're here in the woods, good. North Carolina. What's good, Melstar? What up, though? Body people, you know what it is, Mr. Melstar, AKA the most dangerous in the dirt in the back in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> you matching today? Yeah, you got you got teal on blue on New York City. Man. Dude, I, I, I saw at your house that you had like a pile of, of New York Yankees hats. I do. Black, a pile of them. They were just like, there was a stool. How many black Yankee caps do you own? Shouts out to the Yankees, baby. I do have a lot of hats. I, I never really looked at it, but yeah, I, I do. If you were gonna wear another hat besides a New York Yankees hat, what would it be? A new New York Yankee hat. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is where we are thinking we are no, going it's, to it's shoot right the Mel Star DJ set. We got a pavilion right on the waters. We're about to scare away the fishes. I know we got a guy sitting here fishing right now, but I, I don't think there's gonna be any fishes in this location. When well, Melstar comes in, he brings the bass and we shatter this house. Looks like Gorgeous. How you doing, sir? Oh, yeah. Shout out, sir. What's up? What's good? Damn it, it is nice out here. This is nice. Shit. What? Okay, hold on. I just swung it out right quick. You know what I'm saying? This is Melstar, AK Most Dangerous. You know what this is? Friday night, Friday evening, you know what I'm saying? What's up, man? What's going on, man? Yeah. How you doing? Uh, long time, a little while. It's, it's been, been a while. while. It's been a while. So, uh, we came here. We're in Charlotte. We are. And you did a little bit of a, a set for Cream on Top. I did. Uh, tell me about your set and kind of um, like what, what, it, what it was about. It was beautiful, man. The lake. The rain. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We got rain drops. The nightfall, like I, I, the sun setting was like absolutely cool. The house music, you know, a little bit of everything. Um, the scene, I, I just, the fact that the scene was set, like that was like perfect, I think. Like, it was cool with the sun going down and everything. Drones, cameras all over the place. Side people were like, what is going on over there? It's pretty cool. Uh, the music you played, it was. Um, yeah, most of the music, like 99% of it was mine. Yeah, so it's amazing. that you did. Yeah, it's what I made. Yeah. So, <laughs> you make house music. I do. 
I do. I make a lot of house music. Um, I'm, it's funny about house music. It's like I'm known and not known for it, kind of in that sense, I guess, because of what I do, you know, where I came from, background, and what people have seen visually is like, is he really? Yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Do uh, humbly, humbly. There you go. That part. Mel, so I'm going to be real with you. Talk to me. What's up? In preparation for this interview, mm-hmm. I listened to a lot of interviews with you. Yes, you have. And you chopped it up a lot, a lot, oh, a lot, a lot. Hip hop. Yeah, I did. But you yeah. don't consider yourself a hip hop DJ. No, not at all. Absolutely. What not. kind of a DJ are you? Um, I don't know. Don't even consider myself a DJ. Like, um, yeah, I don't. I I look I look at myself as more of a musician. So how I, I guess, DJ or put the music together, it's like I'm thinking of it musically. Need the drums. I need a, a hook. I need something to say. I need a, a break. I need a breakdown, and I need a finish, and then the next record. Um, yeah. So that's kind of like how I look at it, as opposed to, you know, boxing in myself. You know, uh-huh. per se, as far as being a hip hop DJ, I'm not a hip hop DJ, I'm not. But you play hip hop. <laughs> I do on a lot of. I do. Hip hop radio stations? I do. I do. And you DJ at hip hop clubs? A lot of hip hop clubs, yeah. Um, I mean, the hip hop scene basically kind of like fell in my lap. One and two was like I had to go back while, I guess, in the start of my career to learn it. So funny, I, I've actually gotten a late start in hip hop. Yeah. So my actual out of the doors of like actually playing hip hop was 2000. Okay. Which now is 20 years from now, you know, so I had to learn it. It's a lot, you know, it's, um, you know, aside from knowing all the new stuff, I had a problem with finding all of the classic stuff originally uh-huh. until I was able to get it all. Then I had to get it, find it, listen to people who was doing what? Who's playing parties? Who's doing this? Who's doing that? So I had to go and find out what the scenes were like, who was the DJs of that time, who was doing what, who was creating, you know, all those things. Producers, you know, you want to always look at the credits of who's doing things. And, you know, it it took a, a few years to get it. And um, eventually um, I took a liking to it, obviously. And, um, you know, to put me in a in a no trace situation, I guess <laughs> per se. When you started your career, mm-hmm. you stayed in your bedroom and practiced for uh, six years. Yeah. So um, initially, what happened was, like I said, I kind of like bumped into hip hop, and um, what happened was, I was like, oh wow what the fuck is that? Like, what is that? You know? And it was like, you know, I'm coming from a time where I'm only knowing and listening to house music at the time, which wasn't even called house music, called club music. So club music at the time was the only thing that I knew. And then coming up later, it was like, oh, wow, there's a Run DMC, you know, jacket and I'm like, <laughs> you yeah. know, stuff like that. And then, um, you know, I, my musical background for my family was like really big. So hip hop wasn't the forefront in my home and where I live in my family. So, you know, jazz, it was, it was everything but that, you know what I mean? So like I said, it was just a, a thing of having to have to learn it. So once I really looked into it, that's when I was like, okay, I have to figure out how to do this, uh-huh. you know? And then, like I said, it was just a thing of just wanting to, 
uh, be well-rounded at the time, just wanting to know if there were other genres besides what I already knew. This was another genre, so I had to learn it. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time for me to get it, you know, because like I said, it was changing and it was just, it was, it started from the ground and it just kept building and building and building and building. And it was like more and more and more and more artists and more music and more songs that I never even, you know, heard of. And I had to get it. And I, you know, here we are. <laughs> so, I mean, six years sounds like a, a long time yeah. to yeah. be working at a craft and not be working. Yeah. I mean, how did you do that? that? That was my family. My family allowed me to, you know, this was in my teens at uh -huh. that time. So this is like fresh out of high school. And, um, you know, you're at that stage like, okay, well, what are you going to do? And, you know, I just, the funny thing, you know, I tell people all the time, as far as my background is, it's funny how I went from using a Yuri and a, or a Bozak mixer with, uh, turntables up here instead of everything matching across. So those were things that I had to figure out because coming from the club scene, the clubs only had, uh, so it would be like a Yuri, a Bozak, an isolator, uh, a, a tape, you know, tapes and stuff like that. But they would have three turntables on suspension. And that was basically to keep the bass from shaking and, you know, into the turntable and causing a vibration. Feedback. Right. So that was the only thing that I knew, you know? So finding out later, it was like, oh, whoa, there's B-Boys, there's, there's break dancing, there's, you know, electric boogie and all of that stuff. You know, I mean, I wasn't sheltered. It just, it just wasn't on my mind to go into that lane at the time when I was young. And um, once it was figured out, I was like, okay, I got to stop everything that I'm doing and I need to find out how this all works. And that was the time that I took to do that. So, yeah, and it actually was five years. Five years. Not okay. six, but it was five straight years. So you're talking from anywhere between uh, 95 to 94 to 99, like late. 99 to like right at the peak of 2000. Okay. Literally. And, um, I locked in, I had to buy records. I had to get a little job just to, you know, to get records. Cause now I have all the other records, but no hip hop and R and B records. So, so what was your first gig then? Uh, my first gig was, uh, night new year's <laughs> 1999, right in the 2000 at, um, Bianca's on the park, 110th Street in Central Park West. Typically a night where they need the it most a, DJs a, in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty every, much. Every venue. That was it. That period. Was, that was has a party. And it was my birthday party, actually. So my birthday was in January. So it was like, you know what? Let's do that. And, um, you know, I ran it. It was friends. We were all friends, promoters and stuff like that. So got together got the party and I DJed that party. And that was like my first like promoters party. So right. yeah, so that was it, 2000. And then from that- From that it was over. Like then it turned into, um, you know, I started going into the club scenes heavy and um, then I started getting familiar with the promoters. Mm -hmm. So I was really more based on doing parties for promoters, not so much as going to the club and trying to get a gig. So it was the, it was a, at the time promoters really had a better hand on the clubs, you know, cause no one really knew who the club owners were at the time. So, you know, I ran with a lot of promoters and it took me through, uh, you know, all of this, you know, so. Yeah. That's what happened. That's how it started. Talk to me about the tunnel. Ah, that's now, prime example. Now, <laughs> I understood the tunnel. I've never been there. I, I mm -hmm. never got a chance to go to this club. Right. But I understood the tunnel as a 
disco yeah. nightclub with quote unquote house music yeah. <laughs> and dancing until eight o'clock in the morning right. with the club kids, right. um, et cetera. But I heard in one of your interview that some great hip hop DJs were also yeah. playing there. Yeah, that was the time. Um, who was it? I, Jessica, I believe her name was. Jessica was like a promoter. And she actually had the night there and one of the nights, not the nights, but um, this was like the hot 97 was like boiling, like real crazy. And um, Flex, uh, Big Cat, Cypher Sounds. So at that time, I think it was the, the uh, Big Dog Pitbulls is what they were called at the time. It's the excitement, a whole bunch of them. And um, those particular parties, they were like, that's kind of like what introduced me to like Nas, Blocks, uh, Main Source when they were out. Um, there was a lot. The whole Rough Riders actually came through there. Jay Z, the Rockefeller, all of that mm -hmm. that I've seen came through that building. And that's when I was like, oh, this is going to be really, really big, mm -hmm. like real big. So, you know, like I said, these were the times where I was still growing to figure it out. So, yeah, that's what happened. So you you spent five years in in, in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. I, I'm guessing you were practicing and learning how to cut and scratch. I was I was trying to learn how to play the music aside from scratching and cutting. Again, like I said, um, you know there was um I guess if you've seen the interviews, there were one uh situation where I had a Bozak mixer, and I didn't. Once I actually saw you know, a DJ have a turntable and a mixer in the middle and another turntable on the side. I'm like, wait, wait a minute. And I was wondering like, how are they able to move and maneuver so fast as opposed to, you know, you being here and you have to reach up here and they were just like going this way. And I was like, oh, this is crazy. So when I had got the look and looked and found out, I was like, Ooh, I got to change my mixer. Sure. So, you know, I went to rock and soul. Uh huh. Shouts out to rock and soul. Shouts out to rock and soul. And, um, I went and, um, I took my mixer and I went to rock and soul and I, I, I wanted to trade the mixer for a Gemini mixer. <laughs> it was like the little nasty, Flash Gem Gem Gemini is the mixer that you get. That's the most entry level Yo, mixer. Oh period, God. and it lasts for about six months before Yo. the faders <laughs> start to bleed, and you're you're, you're playing Yo, two tracks man. no matter what out oh, of this mixer. Man. And it was crazy because they, you know, I remember it clearly. Sharon and Shirley was there, and I saw Shirley, and I was like, hey, you know, I want to. I was young, so it was like I was still a teenager, and I walked in. I'm like, "Hey, I want to trade this mixer out. I want to get a, you know, I want to get that mixer right there, that one right there." I saw the little transformers on there, and they're looking at me like I'm crazy. They're like, "Does it work?" But not knowing, you know, this mixer is like three grand at that time. You know, I, I didn't know it because I, you know, I, I inherited it from my my uncle, so I didn't know. Um, and she's like, "You sure?" You sure you want this mixer right here? It was fresh in the box. It was brand new. I'm like, yes, that mixer right there. Even trade. Damn. If I don't know. I don't know. Did you ever try to go back and like you re know, renegotiate? I, I really thought about it, but it was it was way too late. Because now I was like, I have to practice first and do I like this mixer? You know, stuff like that. And of course, I think from practicing the first, I think like maybe like six weeks, <laughs> the mixer started bleeding. <laughs> the faders was like so nasty, man. Ah, oh, damn. Bad luck. That was a big L. Huge L. I took. Yeah. A stock take on me. <laughs> ah. <laughs> ah. Wow. Oh, man. So for those of you who don't know, wow. uh, Metal Star wow. and I were on a DJ reality show called Master the Mix Season, season 2. two. Uh, it was on BET. And I just met wow. this man. And they put me and him on a team. 
It was the gold team. Yeah. And I wore some famous gold shorts. Gold, gold and shorts. And shorts. tell them what you did, Mel. Man, um, wow. That actually, you know, it's funny. That changed my life, actually. Yes. <laughs> it really did. Um, 2010. Yeah. So what happened, basically, um, I was known for having acapellas. Uh-huh. And honestly, the whole purpose was just to pull off the acapella of the record of having take on me. And I knew, you know, none of the guys had it or the ladies had it. And, um, and as I was going through the record, I was like, wait a minute, Dougie sounds kind of cool with that record as I'm thinking. And it just came to pass. And that was pretty much it. You know, we didn't really have time to put our sets together. It was like, yeah. okay, we're going here. And okay, here, here's your list. Go. Oh, no. rock the party. <laughs> don't play doubles. No, yeah, don't play doubles. <laughs> right. So, and that really was exactly how that happened. And it was just really, I really was just trying to pull the acapella off. Yeah. But I still had to keep the party going because you needed a beat. And that was so it. This this mix, and I'll, I'll admit it, he played Aha by Take, Take On Me into Teach Me How to Doogie by whoever song, yeah. like whoever wrote that, it doesn't matter. Um, and I literally bit your mix <laughs> at almost every party that I played for wow. years because that mix yeah, that was, was so dope. Yeah, that was... And this, like, this was a... It changed this, my this, life. This was, a, <laughs> this, this was a best in craft mix. Right. Like a best in craft mix. Tell me one best in craft piece of another DJ that that you do, that you saw, that you incorporated into your artistry um, for, for the long time? It probably would have to be um, like the routines of like uh, Raider, Rock Raider, Rest in Peace, Jazzy Jeff. Like they had like specific records that were like that would get the crowd at a, at a standstill in that awe. So it was like, you know, when you want to be on the stage, you want to play or do something that would snatch the souls of the people. And, you know, obviously Jeff was like, uh, at the time I remember was dancing the drummer's beat. Rock Raider was a uh, sucker MC. So, you know, Raider was just like, ah, and like the crowd would stop. Oh shit. And then it was like, once he was done, it was like, it was kind of like, I dropped the mic and I'm done and I'm walking off, you know? And then the same thing with Jeff. Jeff, you know, the, the, the dance to the drummer's beat routine really caught a lot of my attention. And those are like signature records that yeah. I like, you know? And again, with practice, you know, I had to come up with my own type of routine to figure it out and put it together. And that was it. That's the start. You are from Harlem. I am. And you rock the New York parties. And a few years ago or a year ago, you said, said, Jameson, I'm going to Vegas. <laughs> you remember that, huh? <laughs> you said, I am going to go to yeah, Vegas. I did. Damn, you remember that? Yeah, I remember everything. Wow. You can't tell me a thing and wow. not have yeah. me remember it. I was very serious about that. You know what's funny? Um my whole concept with Vegas was I saw AM. Great DJ. <sighs> yeah, he was dope. And what I liked Where? about him, um, I used to see, what was that place? First, the first place I seen, I think he was in New York. Uh -huh. It was like some down, downtown area, um, all the way downtown, like in the, the meat packing district area. Uh -huh. I don't recall the name, but it was kind of like a, uh, like not a club, but like a bar, like, but it was like, it was crazy. It was crazy. And I, I seen him and I saw that, um, he was playing rock and roll, yeah. hip hop, house, EDM. And he would like take all that shit and put it all together and just create a party. So it was like, he would go here and it was just like, dip, and then it's like really high. And then it's just like, he'll keep him there until he's ready. And then it was like, all right, 
we're getting the fuck out of here. But that was like literally like for like a a two hour set. Like so once I seen that, that's what kind of really I guess you know, like people call it open, open format. Open format, yeah. Right. So I, I felt like that was open format. That that was. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So for me it was like, whoa, this is exactly what I want to do. Uh-huh. And um once I started to understand like I guess the level of the business part of it, because that was what I didn't know. It was just I was just wanting to do parties and do parties. And then I started understanding like there's a business part to that. And I seen, you know, him, I saw Jeff, I seen um, Z Trip and a couple other guys that was just running. And I was like, I want to be like that guy. Like he's dope. Like he's all around dope. You know, it's a lot of DJs. I love a lot of the DJs that were, um, that I saw even in my come up, but it was just something specific with him because it was the openness of how he played. And it was like, he wasn't scared to play it. Well, DJ AM also, he opened the door up for every DJ in the world to charge a lot of money. A whole lot of money. Yeah. He DJ did. AM. <laughs> yeah, um, did. Shouts out to DJ AM. Rest in peace. Yeah. Incredible just, DJ. Yeah. If you haven't seen his documentary, Crazy. you should check it out. It's yeah. on Netflix. Yes, it is. He's the first person to charge 10 grand, then 20 grand, then 30 grand, then 40 grand, then 50, 50. grand. DJing in Las Vegas. Facts. That's just the facts. And he opened he opened the door up for every DJ entrepreneur yeah, and, or business person. And also remembering too, that's where the format changed too, because again, at that time, you know, it was just pretty much house and EDM on the strip, period. Yeah. Pretty much. So for me, it was like that's the route that I want to go. You know, and again, shouts out to all the DJs. I've seen a lot of DJs in my years, but that was the one that really stuck out the most to me. Like mm -hmm. it's cool to play a rock record and be cool and still play it and get it off. And no one is like, what the fuck is going on? What is that? Mm -hmm. What are you doing? You know? So it was just obviously, you know, when you, you get the trust to be able to do what you want to do is, is, is endless, endless. And once I saw that, that's when I was like, yeah, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah. So you got the skills to pull it off. Um, yeah, pretty much. Okay, I, I told you that. Yeah. I, I didn't, that wasn't a question. <laughs> yeah. I, was, I was not asking you a question. <laughs> I was not asking you a question. I know that you have the skills to pull that off. Okay. Give me. Okay, you talked. You mentioned the word business. Right. The people that are going to be watching this, the creamers, y'all are creamers, by the way. In case you haven't figured that out, talk to me about business as a DJ, like, like, give me, give me a piece of knowledge that give me one little tidbit, one little fact that, that for a DJ coming up in the game, a DJ that, you know, might've listened to DJ AM's mixtapes mm -hmm. or something like that. And is like, shit, yeah, I, I need to do that. The most important thing I will always um, say is respect the craft. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Um, respect the craft and understand the craft, you know what I'm saying? Understand the music, understand wh what you're stepping into when you're going down those lanes. You know, like I said, Vegas, for instance, is a big deal, you know, which, you know, I didn't think it was. I just thought it was just, oh, I'm just gonna go to Vegas and yeah, whatever, I'm gonna flex the DJ muscle and I'm good and it was like, far from that, you know, so that's where the business comes in with, uh, curating relationships and knowing where to go, who's the, who, what's what, you know, things like that. Um, it was fucking hard. <laughs> it, was fucking, it was really hard. I, I really don't, I guess, give out that kind of information because my whole thing was always, you know, you practice, you learn it, you understand it, you get it, and then go forward with it. Yeah. You know, and that that's usually my direction on how I did things. So, yeah, I'll leave it there. If I'm a DJ mm -hmm. and my goal is to play in Vegas mm -hmm. and I'm already good. Right. What can I do? One step 
to make that dream happen? Um, well, you have to go to Vegas to find that out. Um, yes, that's go to, to Vegas. Vegas. To find, that, find out for yourself. Um, all situations are different from all situations. And, you know, getting your break sometimes could be really easy. And then sometimes it can be very hard. Yeah. So it just, sometimes it's that thing of the, being there at the right place at the right, finding the right space at the right time. It's just, yeah, you, you just gotta go to Vegas and find out for yourself. Like, it is not like how we would be in New York or any other states and you just walk in and you can just find your way into a club. You know, it, it doesn't work like that out there. It's a different. Political almost. It's, it's very political. It's a different animal, definitely. What, what is the first club that you played at in Vegas? Uh, my first place was on the record. Okay. OTR. Tell me about that. And um, OTR was, man, super dope. Um, club, five rooms, mm -hmm. uh, main room. Then they have this other side room where they just um, play like hip hop, classic hip hop and R&B. The main room was like top 40. And, um, you know, it's, it's dope. Like it, it's, it's an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. And what I think what they did was they, they created an atmosphere for you to have fun. You know, they still like, you know, you walk in, they have like the old school, uh, radios and on one side and they have the old school TVs on the other side and the old speakers, just kind of giving you a, a mindset of remembering like, my childhood and and still being able to party at the same time uh -huh. super dope super dope what were your first sets like there um let, let's say compared to yeah my my first well that was the thing i i've always felt like you know being who you are is that is what you should always present to whomever you're playing for so if you're being flown from New York to come to any other state, you'd figure that they would want your style or, you know, but as a DJ, like I said, that, that the pluses of knowing genres and stuff like that, you get to understand the state. Well, Vegas is LA kind of sort of to me. So, you know, you want to kind of have, the East Coast, West Coast vibe. Okay. And if you don't have that, it's like, we're going to just listen to Biggie all night. We are in LA. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So you get to understand those things, you know, like being in a club and knowing, like, you just know, like, you, that's what a DJ is supposed to have. Like, they're supposed to know. Yeah. You go to, you know, how do you not go to Chicago and not play common? Uh -huh. You know what I mean? How do you not go to Detroit and not listen to Dilla? You know, or how do you not go to New York and not listen to Steely Dan or, or, or Billy Joel, or, you know what I'm saying? You still got the hip hop joints, but you, you still got to find other ways, especially because you just don't know what type of party or atmosphere you're going to be in. So you want to always be ready yeah. at all times. So I go to Atlanta, I mean, um, Atlantic city. And every time I go there, I always have a fresh Frank Sinatra record every time at any party. How do you, how do you polish I a just, fresh, I just go, fresh Sinatra record? Well, I mean, like, what was the first record? The first time I went and played in Atlantic <laughs> city, I played, like how? I played the acapella of New York, New York. New York, New York. And everybody oh, yeah. was like, yo, they thought he was in, like they thought somebody was singing this record. So I, as I'm doing that, I'm seeing people running off the slot machines like, yo, who the fuck is in here singing that? Second time I went, I played um, Fly Me to the Moon, acapella. Um, you know what I'm saying? So it's just, you know, my whole thing was always, you know, my mode is to erase everything you've heard for the entire night with that one record that just we're like, wait, whoa, whoa, what happened? What's going on here? You hit the reset button. Hit the reset button every time. And 
once you hit the reset button, then it's like, okay, now you have their attention. Now you have to go somewhere right. and play. So, okay. Yeah. So you're in Vegas or I'm sorry, you're in Atlantic city mm -hmm. and you play Frank Sinatra. What comes next? Um, it, it could be a party record. It could be a party record or it could be a, Get everyone out of the dance Yeah, floor. just right on the floor. You know, like, right. I'm, I'm always for the party. I'm always for the party. So me, a party record for most likely. Yeah. Yeah. You've claimed that you have no signatures or things that you're known for. <laughs> oh, man. I don't. Um, yet. <laughs> yet. Let me right, finish my question. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have acapellas that no one else has. Yeah. And you are incredibly prolific about that. Yeah, that was just something that the people gave me. You know, they were like, he has all the acapellas. And, you know, I, again, like I said, it was, this is, again, it goes back to the thing that I was saying about DJing. Like, my whole purpose is to always create the separation from what, the other person was doing so that way they would ha i i want to put you in a position where you have no choice but to listen to what the fuck i'm getting ready to do because it's like oh shit he just did he just play you know and then that's the lore you know so that was just a name that everybody gave me and and people just I, it stuck i well, guess what's the name he, acapella, he just plays acapella, acapellas. Yeah. yeah, he's the acapella king and he has all the acapellas. Listen, I don't, I was about to say that I do not make acapellas, y'all. I don't make them. I don't know how to make them. Um, a lot of the, the records that I had, they were on vinyl, a lot of them. Um, promos were like real, like serious at the time. And um, I was on that list of oh, promos. So I was able to get that. What was it? The uh, the main, the instrumental, the acapella and the radio version. That's uh, usually how that, how that worked. So I had those and I took the time. And like I said, all of these things within the five years and all of that stuff was you need to record. I was recording also. Yeah. So I knew about the digital world was about to come in. You know, the final scratch was terrible. And, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was like three of them, but I knew all of this was coming. So it was like, okay, let's just get prepared now, yeah. you know? And, and I did that. That was what my five years did to me. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So COVID happened. COVID definitely so happened. You, you were, you were spending, in Vegas, you were on the record. You were living the dream. Living the dream. Be or working towards the dream, right? Uh, Shouts out to the Wayans brothers yeah. who, who gave me that quote that you never are actually living the dream. You're only working towards yeah. the dream, and that is the dream. It's right. actually just doing the work. Work in progress. Um, and you love your yeah. crap. Absolutely. What have you been doing in COVID and what's next? What have you been thinking about in this sort of five month period so far? Um, a few things. Uh, one, I started really locking down and uh, creating more, making more records and making more remixes and things like that. So that actually kind of gave me a reset, kind of sort of. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, from the party aspect, it became virtual. So, you know, that's how like, uh, it was a Twitch and OBS and all those things have come up. And, um, so I would still utilize that time. I'm on the radio, you know, so those are the things that I've, I've, I've constantly been just always doing something aside from DJing in a club right. or being anywhere. So I always had, you know, and then I was DJing for Houdini as well. So this is, these are all of the things that, you know, you save <laughs> for moments like this, right. you know, just in case if some shit happened and you can't recoup or, you know, come back. So yeah, I made a lot of records. That's one. Um, yeah, I made a lot of records. I made a lot of records. I took a lot of time to, um, 
make a lot of records. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, I'm going to say a name. Talk to me. And you are going to tell me the funniest thing Uh-oh. that comes to mind when I say this name. Okay. Nothing else. I don't want to hear no other stories. Just the funniest thing that comes to mind. Okay. Bismarcky. Good friend. Very good friend. That's funny. That guy is good. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny that he's your friend. He like, he, um, what's that he always says? Yo, Mel, what's the latest? Every, <laughs> <laughs> every call, yo, Mel, what's the latest? <laughs> uh, Usher. Bad motherfucker. That's funny. I don't want to, Actually, this um, is not the first yeah, thing that comes yeah, to mind. This is the funniest the thing. The funniest thing? Um, good dancer. I don't, <laughs> I don't That's know, funny. You know. He got some moves for he a guy. He got the moves. He got the moves, man. He got the moves. Okay. Ludacris. Luda. <laughs> there you go. Luda. That is the funniest tagline yeah. out of all, Luda. all rappers. Yeah. I, I'm, I think this guy's got to have something funny. Buster Rhymes. Yo, what the deal, son? It's <laughs> good, son. Yeah. We'll keep going on this list I got. Jay-Z. It's the rap. <laughs> Jada Kiss. Oh, man. Jada's like that. <laughs> Yo, once I heard that, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, he really does that. Like, uh, Kanye West. Absolutely. He's just crazy. Just all the way around. He's just crazy. All the way around. K. Capri. Ah. Beast. Now I know you, I know you know yeah. this guy personally, so you've <laughs> got to come up with a funny story. Um, I went to K. Capri's house one night and I was chilling. You know, I don't smoke. God, yo, when I tell you by the time I walked out the door, I was so fucking high. Oh my God. That was the most, yeah, I was, yo, I was high. Mm -hmm. And all I did was laugh all the way out until I fucking got home. I couldn't contain myself. I was just, (laughs) all through the fucking night, he's like, yo, no one told no fucking jokes was wrong with you. Yeah. And I'm like, Yo, kid, I think I'm high, man. I think I'm high, man. He just was like, yo, man, what's up, me? You all right over there? And I was like, I, I don't know, man. I feel like a little weird. And I went to get I was like, yo, man, I'm high, man. I am fucking high. And he just, yo, when I tell you, he bust out laughing and was still smoking. Just, <laughs> you know. It was like a big bomb. <laughs> just blew the room up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Shit was crazy. Yeah, kid was a kid. You smoke you in his house, he's gonna smoke. Hey, kid. This is his house. This is his house. Gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> Q tip. Ah, man. Um, conversations. I've like I've heard like a few conversations, and I was I was I wasn't in it. I was amongst it. And it would just, he would just be like, yeah, yo, you know what I'm saying? I was over there with my niggas, you know, and I ain't, you know, and what the fuck, man? And it was, and it was like, what did he just fucking say? But you couldn't really hear him because it was going so fucking fast. I was like, what? Nah, tip is, tip is. So, so he raps fast and he talks he fast. He raps and talks fast. Absolutely. <laughs> that is a fast brained man. Yeah, definitely. Quick thinker. <laughs> Quick thinker. Quick thinker. Okay. I know that you are super present on Facebook. I am. And Instagram, I am. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. What's your social media strategy? None. <laughs> <laughs> None. Um, and I probably need a better presence, even with what's happening or what's going on. I'm, I'm like, you know, I see like people pre-plan and say, hey, I'm going to be on at eight. I'll just click on at eight. As opposed to just, you know, I just feel like if people want to check for you, they're just going to check for you. And especially if they follow you, yeah. they're going to see you. So it's either up to them to say, hey, I'm going to watch them or fuck them. What do you think about ghost writers? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Um, 
shouts out to Drake and and (laughs) Drake is doing all right, you know. Um, Wow. Um, Ghostwriting is fucking absolutely dope. Okay. Fucking dope. Absolutely dope. 100%. I'm with that smoke all day. Yeah. Ghostwriting is fucking dope. What's <laughs> <laughs> the most valuable thing that's been given to you? Um, well, shit is right behind you. Um, those two drives for my father. Is it this one? Or is it the other one? I think it's the other one. It's not heavy enough. That's heavy. Yeah, that's heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. I'm not opening it. But this shit right here was the greatest possession that my father ever gave me right here. This is it. This. This is this is it. This is it. See how heavy it is? That's heavy. Why don't you have this? If if this is your greatest possession, why don't you have it in a in a safety deposit box? Because I use it all the time. <laughs> this is where you get all the time is I it, use it. it. So since we can't see what's in this, yeah, yeah, this uh, you definitely don't want to open it. This thing is this like the almanac in Back that's, to the Future? That's that's fucking. Is this the Back almanac? to the Future? Is this how you make your bets? That's, that's the Jetsons, Back to the Future. Yeah, all of that. Jetsons was was. was Can you hum me the Jetsons too? <laughs> I played it the other day too. Damn. No, you did not. I sure fucking did. I played like all the television shows the other day. On the radio. So back in the day, mm-hmm. um, a DJ, like when, when you were coming up, mm-hmm. early 2000s, yep. it was the job of a DJ, in my understanding, um, at a lot of the clubs that I went to in, in the early 2000s, to know your TV themes. Yeah, absolutely. Because you rocked the TV theme in the club and stuff like that. Um, they were just like fun segues to before the party. You I'll know. be there for you. you. Cheers was like, come on, man. Like, um, dun, 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 like dun. having everybody in there screaming, wouldn't you like, you know, you're in there. Come on, man. It's the shit. Then it kind of faded out. It did because it was, it started getting back to who's really rocking. It got to that. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, the gimmicks was like dead. Like, nah, you're not banging, you're not rocking this party. We have no use for you. And that's really what it was. Do, do you think, like, do you think that there's a space for the music to kind of open up again? Because with this COVID, mm-hmm. now this is me like hypothesizing, and we're just yeah, like, like, like absolutely. free association right Let's here. Let's talk right? about it. Yeah. The clubs are going to be a little bit more spacious when you get back in. They will be. What is your take on what's going to be possible? that's new in, in music, in DJing a club? Um, new or old? Are you going to be able to do old things again? Like- yeah, I, I definitely don't think old things will be done for a bit. Um, but the funny shit is new things are going to be the old things. It's like the music. D-Nice. Shout out to D-Nice. So be nice did the club quarantine thing. And what was amazing that what he did was he kind of reopened everyone's minds to listen to songs that we haven't heard or played in a long time. And what it did was it kind of like trickled into a lot of other DJs, well-known DJs, you know, to like, Hey, let's open up the library. Let's start playing some things. And, you know, so now I think now, you know, we're always at a fast pace. Everything's moving, 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 moving. And I think now everybody's kind of got like a, 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 a hot sit down moment. And then it's like, Oh shit. I remembered this record or I remembered that record. And I think now it's kind of like, changing the mindsets. So I think partying would probably be a little different now more than it would as it was before. Before it was trap. And 
it's funny because I'm like thinking now I'm like, you know, that music is not as prevalent as it was when the clubs were open. You see what I'm saying? So I'm seeing the shift and it's shifting fast, you know, because remember, you got to think about it. Trap, there was a record every day, every day, uh-huh. 20 records a day, maybe more a day, every day. Yeah. So I, I it, it seems like to me, it just seems like it's going to be a shift. Um, whether it's good or bad, I think what's going to happen is DJs are going to have a serious issue if they do not have an extensive library. I think that's going to be the issue <laughs> with DJs now. Have you touched your Strictly Rhythm Records over this quarantine period that you talked about in the We Have No DJs podcast? Yeah. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I have, um, but it's a reason <laughs> because one record, like one album, it could be like recording that one out one, one album could be about 25 minutes, yeah. literally one per cause records were like seven minutes. And then it was like the eight minute dub and then the six minute acapella. Then you have to flip the C side, the C and the D side. This is on one record. And that's like seven more minutes and eight more minutes. So it's like for recording, you got to have a serious mind to like, cause you got to sit down, you got to record it. You got to go in. I put everything in Pro Tools. So I got to record it in Pro Tools. Everything's in real time. Yeah. Go back, cut it, beef it, make sure it sounds good. Make it right. Oh, it's good. All right. Snip. Next record. Nice. So on and so on and so on. So we're talking about a lot of fucking records for Strictly Rhythm. For those of you who don't know, Melstar has an entire basement full of records. <laughs> and he was one of the first guys to digital, digitalize yeah. These, yeah. these records. Facts. And uh, you, you, if, go check out the, the Without No DJs podcast. He, he talks about it in yeah. there. We don't need to go it's into lot, detail. Yeah. It was a lot. Ugh. What's the busiest you've ever been? It's funny. It seems like now. Um, and <laughs> you know, during the Dude, season, lucky like son now, of a bitch. I'm like, you know, I, I, I'm I'm on a radio heavy. Yeah. Right now, um, 108 Soul, um, Boston, um, Heat, the Heat Station. I call it the Heat Station. Heat Station in Boston, um, Vegas, Power 88 in Vegas, um. Rock the Bells Radio as well. As well. Shout out to LL Cool J. Cool J. Trip. Yeah, James. And um, yeah. So it's like that's pretty much a, a, a everyday thing. How much DJing is too much? Oh, you gotta eat every day, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Um, that's a good question. I never. I'm a work progress. So I, I, I've never looked at ever thinking about stopping ever. Like I just never, it's like, even if you have everything, it's still not enough and you still have to work hard to keep that. So I don't know, probably never for me. Tell me, t- tell me the, what's, what's the difference between a function one sound system Ooh. and a Richard long, long. Sound ah, system. Damn. Background. Function one is probably the one of the most prolific uh, uh, club systems of, of, of today. It is. And Richard Long, well, uh, rest, uh, rest in peace, was a sound system designer who did the sound system in uh, Studio 54 uh, and the tunnel. Tunnel. I think he did also. If I'm at the garage, I believe. So it was like, yeah. So the dopest shit that I've ever seen with, with the sets or sound systems that they had, like that was like one of the times where I was introduced to like what they call a crossover. So like they would have like in that 80, well, it was built, they built it, I guess, anywhere between the seventies and eighties. But when I was able to go see it, it was like, I've never seen that was like a three-way system at the time. So you had where they were able to separate everything, the bass, the mids and the highs. Right. 
And it, it was just the most am amazing shit I've ever heard in my entire life. And then they had the sound system Bertha's. So they had like these, heat, like the speaker would be as big as this, but this wide, like, yeah. and they had tons of them in the club. Function one is dope. I mean, obviously it's state of the art now, you know, times change. Um, and you know, back then it were like amps, racks and stuff like that. But, um, function one is dope, but that Richard Long was a different kind of different. It was different. It was very different. And it was like, you could be standing right here. And if you decided to just walk right there, you could actually have a conversation right over here, but you couldn't right here. Like yeah. that Sonics has. Did you get to play on one? Um, Cialo, I believe, I think, I think, I think, I think has part of a Richard Long system. So in part function one. Yeah, in part function one. So they had like, you know, the, the true deck, which was the three turntables oh, and the, the, the sound system, all of the it. complete sound the system. Complete, turntables, yeah, that whole bit. Three. Yeah. yeah. So and a rotary mixer? A rotary mixer. Louis, Louis Vega, shout out to Louis Vega. You talk to 80 people a day. <laughs> just, just about, yeah. And sorry about that. I know you sat through a lot of those calls. <laughs> you manage sorry. hundreds of comments on social a day. Yeah. How much confusion is in your mind? Probably a lot. Uh, I, I speak for several people in my mind. <laughs> Literally, like I speak for several people in my mind. So, yeah, it's hard. It's hard. That's hard. What's hard about it? Um, well, you have to, you got your day, which is not long. Uh -huh. So you have to put a whole bunch of things. It's like, it's like taking an ethernet cable and trying to stick it into a phone jack. Don't fit. Exactly. Doesn't fit. At all. Period. And that's period. period. <laughs> <laughs> you don't and that and that's that's kinda like what happens. Um I do a lot, you know, and um I do a lot of phone calling. I, I get a lot of calls. I make a lot of texts. I try to post, stay, you know, as they say, stay relevant and mm -hmm. And also put up the things that I want of choice. And, you know, <clears throat> to some degree, I'm looked at, you know, as far as like equipment and stuff like that. And I try to stay up on it. And I also try to utilize that to give information off to, to the people who probably want to learn it, you know, um, the ones that are on it already and, you know, stuff like that. So it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. What equipment are you excited about these days? Um, you actually are leaning on it. Yeah. Then on the good GoPro rest with a GoPro rest. Yeah. And the, um, the, the zoom. <laughs> we have the, the Dinon DJ, uh, yeah, the 6,000, six, the 6,000. Uh, you can check Mel using them and we unbox oh. them. Yeah. They're pretty, they're pretty dope. These are the M's cause they're motorized. Pretty smart. Very smart. And you can still keep the, you know, the, the, the concept of DJing with, as if it was an actual turntable. So that to me is yeah, they, dope. Yeah, they, they, they spin and it's a, yeah. it's a platter. Yeah. So now they sit next to the 5,000s. 5,000s look small now. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> How do you draw information as somebody who plays on the radio every day of the week? Yes. How do you draw information? inspiration for so many DJ sets week in and week out without an audience? Um, so what I do for an audience is I will reach to the social media department mm -hmm. and I'll like say, Hey, hit me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, you know, at DJ Mel Star to those two hours. People will come in and you know, it's never a plan on as far as like what I'm going to play, but what I do do is I check and see the mood 
of the people. Yeah. So like someone will be like, I'm on the highway right now and I'm ready for you right now. Then you have some people are like, oh man, this is a long day. Oh, I'm tired and, but I can't wait to hear you or something like that. So to me, I look at that as the mood of what the people are in. So I would take, and you know, who's when it was, and it's funny because I kind of learned that from Michael McPherson. Okay. Shout out to Michael McPherson. Michael McPherson. Michael McPherson came up with this, this whole thing of, he said he called it the mood, mood, mood designing. Uh-huh. And I kind of, I like that. Like, cause it's like, I, but the difference with me is that I create the mood from what I'm looking, what I'm reading. And, and, you know, so if someone's having a bad day, I can actually play a record and still keep the flow. And like, I guess kind of sort of like, let them know like, Hey, it's all right. You had a bad day, but I'm gonna play a lovely day for you. You know what I mean? And I want you to have a lovely day. And then I'll say their names. Or I'll shout them out. So it's like, Oh shit. He spoke to me. So, and then I, I also do that too, because I think people think that you're not live, you know? So that kind of takes it for a shock. Like, Oh shit. He said my name. She's yeah. like, yeah. So, you know, stuff like that. So, so, do you take requests? Yeah, I have no problem with requests. No problem with requests. Right. None at all. Um, I think the radio is for the people. Sure. I think it's for them. So, yeah. You want to request? Sure. Do you take requests in the club? No. But then, not to be a, you know, I don't really get asked that much. It might be once in the blue, not as much because my whole purpose of the club is murder. Like I am in the club to kill the club. Like I don't even, and I, I try to do it in a way where it's so impactful that you don't have to ask me for a record. Sure. All right. What's the difference between DJing for DJs and DJing at a party? Like, let's say, you're at the player's tr- retreat mm-hmm. and they ask you to do a set and you're DJing a set for all of your peers or you're at a park jam and it's a bunch of, uh, you know, DJs and like colleagues of sort. Okay. What's the difference between being at a club and DJing for people that, you know, probably don't know you personally and DJing for colleagues? DJing for your colleagues to me is more of showcasing. So like, this is just that moment where you want to show your skills to your friends. You know what I mean? Because they're not the ones that's going to pay you later. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't have to, you know what I mean? Real talk. Right. So it's really like, Hey, I'm just going to show you some shit. I'm going to show you, you know, and, and I think, and it's funny cause that's kind of like, you know, me playing acapellas, like, those were those type of situations, but I wouldn't do that at the party. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So now the party is a whole different animal. Like, you know, you're going there to do a job versus just, Hey, I'm just with my friends and we're just going to start just cutting all day. Nah, it doesn't work like that. There's a question from the audience. (sighs) Do you have a, do you have specific names for your cuts? And when do you know when it's time to execute a certain cut or do you freestyle every single cut or is there a sequence and a pattern that you must abide by? Uh, I don't have any names for any of the cuts <laughs> that I do. I, I really don't. Um, I'm, I'm really honestly more on, on off the cuff. Like I, my build for DJing is really from the impact of the people, like literally. I mean, I I will do what I need to do, but you know, sometimes you might just have somebody just oh my God, and that gives you that extra energy to do some other shit, you know, and yeah, you know, it all, like I said, again, like that's what's gonna make this 
all interesting when the parties start again because that all of those things are going to be the things that are going to be missing now mm -hmm. from the parties because it's now it's social distance there will be no one right in front of you so now it's going to be a situation where oh shit some get make it stuck and be like oh shit i don't know what to play oh shit are they having a good time am i doing a good job you know what i mean so just you keep the confidence and you know what you do or what you're doing you should be fine so walking into your house mm -hmm. <laughs> pile of yankee hats <laughs> yeah um you know more mixers than i've ever seen um oh, man. In, in, in a store even <laughs> <laughs> your house your records on the wall um, your house clearly speaks to someone who is incredibly passionate about music. I am. Is there anything else that you're equally passionate about? I mean, my family, you know, of course, shouts out to my family. Um, no, this is it. Yeah, this, this is it. This is how I eat. This is how I live. This is how... Um, you, I utilize this to take care of my family as well. So like, this is it. So I, I don't have any other, it's nothing else. It's just this. That's amazing. Yeah. And, and I love it. I love what I do. If you could make a piece of hardware, what would that piece of hardware do? A mixer. <laughs> I was hoping that you wouldn't ask me anything like that <laughs> just on the fact that you saw all these mixers and, and a Yankee hat and another Yankee hat. Um, nah, you know what? I, um, dude, if I owned a Yankee hat factory, I'd probably be rich. Yeah. It, it looks like one. I know. I know. It's crazy. Um, yeah. Mixer. I, I would think making a new mixer would be something that I would really want to do. And I, I guess that's why I have so many because I'm always, I'm finicky and I haven't found the perfect mixer yet. So that's why I, I go through a bunch of them. So yeah. It gives you something to do? It always gives me something to do. Oh, Actually. let me test out this mixer. Oh. Yeah, let me test. Yeah. And then I'll like it and then, okay, what's next? And then it's like, okay, this is cool. And and I just keep switching and switching. Plus, they're all new. They, you know, the the, uh, the technology is here also. So you know, I I am one of those geeks that want to keep up with all things mm -hmm. and what's going on. And you know, I don't want to go to a party and and I plug up and, and my firmware doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Shit like that. It's not cool. If hip hop died, what would you do? Oh, I would be playing house. No questions asked. <laughs> That's simple. What would the first house music record you would play be if hip hop was dead? Shouts out to hip hop. This is a real question. It would probably be um probably one of my tracks. Which one? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I like Peach House. I like uh Dawid. I like the other record, What's My Name? Um, yeah, those might be the ones and they big, so they sound real big. So yeah. Are they out? Can you can no. Nah. No. The guys holding back records. Nah, you know, uh, you know, I've I've learned that too from um other DJs where you know you have to have something for yourself. <laughs> At least, you know, so I, I utilize those for myself for the moment, just for the moment. I'll release some songs. So this is the part of the show where you get to ask me a question. Okay. Only one. Only one question I get to ask you. Yeah. Let's see. Let me think about it. Um, Cause the questions that I ask you next are going to be really tough. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> where is uh cream on top going? Cream on top is going all over the world. We are going to, many incredibly beautiful places. We will be hosting live events on Mount Rushmore. Nice. Uh, probably at the pyramids. You know what? That might be my next party, my next um, outing, not party, 
outing. Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore. I think I I, I I I think I think that the, the the America is such a beautiful place, and I want to capture all of its beauty. That's really like being on top, like literally. I mean, literally. If, if anybody has seen the movie Richie Rich, where he had his own Mount Rushmore, you know, I want to I want to film some people DJing at the Grand Canyon. I want to film. Um, Our next film is in the mountains, definitely. You know, I want to, I want to DJ, I want to film a DJ at Air Force One. Nice. Which is in, which is in Texas. Nice. I scout, I scouted at the uh, Susan well, B. They, Anthony they, they, or yeah. something. The Elliot, I don't know. There's, there's an old Air Force One in Texas, and I was like, oh shit, we got to do a party there. Tough. Somebody's gonna DJ there. I'll, Tough. I'll make it happen. So. Um. All right, that's a good question. Yeah, you know. Okay. Caught you off guard. Yeah. No. What is your favorite word? Shit. Fuck. What the fuck? Um, damn. Oh, shit. Wow. Hmm. Really? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> Wow. All, Shit. all right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Cool. What the fuck? Word? Oh shit. Really? Wow. Oh those. Okay. You answered Sorry. about ten, but that that's that's 10. that's yeah, that's well, chill. It's, it's your question to answer. <laughs> What's your least favorite word? No. <laughs> What's your favorite curse word? Fuck. What's your favorite trend? That's a good fucking question. See? Fuck, see? I just said, thing. It's a good fucking question. I don't know about the past one now. I forget. I got to think about that. That's a good one. Okay. What's your least favorite trend? <laughs> this is another pass. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay. What turns you on? Hmm. A good fucking steak. Rib I prefer. Medium. Garlic. Salt, pepper, crushed peppers. Any sides? Mashed potatoes and garlic. Butter sauce. And, uh... Yeah, some string beans. Actually, you know what? Might have to do that this evening. Take a shot of that too. So I, uh, you know. What turns you off? Um trolling. 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 Yeah. Trolling. I think that um we have given people too much open access to you. And People are really judgmental when they don't know, you know, that doesn't necessarily have to do with me, but just on an overall scale, you know? So yeah, trolling, I think is pretty bad. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Melstar, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Thank you for embracing us and embracing the questions and coming here and and uh, giving us the good word. The good word. And thank you for your DJ set, uh, which we Appreciate recorded it. yesterday. And uh, if you haven't checked it out, go check that out. You can find Melstar on the internet. Yeah. DJ Melstar. Two L's, two R's. Two L's, two R's. Um, you can listen to him on a bunch of radio stations. All those links are going to be in the yeah. down in, below in the show notes. DJ app. And, oh, and he needs to get a DJ app. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Creamers, if you liked this segment with DJ Mel Star, then give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. If you want to see more, subscribe and hit the bell icon. If you want to tell us what to do, then leave a comment below. And if you want to know what really happened to Apollo 13, follow us on Instagram. Get creamers.